Hello, and welcome to another episode of Cardio Metabolic Beat, brought to you by the Cardio Metabolic Health Congress. We are so excited to speak with Dr. Philomena Trindade, a physician, teacher, author, and internationally recognized speaker who focuses on functional medicine and a holistic preventative approach to care. Our topic of discussion today will be the progression of type 2 diabetes and whether we can slow or reverse this progression. Welcome, Dr. Trindade. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, before we get into the complex question of reversing type 2 diabetes, I want to start by asking, what do we know now after decades of research about the development of type 2 diabetes? Is there anything else that we are missing? That's a great question. Um, You know, it always takes so long from the time when the scientific um, information or, or scientific discovery is made before it gets applied into clinical practice. And I feel like this is one area where that has been especially true because we have known for 10, 15 years, for example, that type 2 diabetes is on this continuum, right? It's not a autoimmune condition like type 1, although there is the lot of latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, which Mm -hmm. can be. So you can be a type 2 and then sort of become autoimmune, but mostly because we're on this spectrum. So you can be insulin sensitive and then become hyperinsulinemic insulin resistant. And that's sort of the first step. You then progress to glucose tolerance. You can further progress to prediabetes and then onto diabetes. But the, what the research is showing is that more and more we're seeing patients along that continuum that may not develop. So your, your full-fledged type 2 diabetes, but they may be glucose tolerant or insulin resistant or even prediabetic, and yet they suffer the same consequences. And so then the next question is, well, why? And for that, I really feel we have to look at the work of Dr. Barbara Corky, which has published extensively. In 2011, she won the Banting Lecture of the Year Award, which was in memory of Dr. Banting that contributed quite a bit to the field of diabetes for her work on type 2 diabetes. And what she says, and there's other researchers that corroborate this, she's sort of just at the top of her field, is that it's all about damage to the pancreatic beta cell. So that type 2 diabetes is all about pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. And if you look at it from that perspective, there's a lot that you can do in identifying the triggers, what caused the pancreatic beta cell dysfunction, and then trying to reverse it. But it's really all about hyperinsulinemia, where you develop hyperinsulinemia, and that leads to insulin resistance. And then you are on this continuum, whether you get to type 2 diabetes or not, but it's all about sort of how much pancreatic beta cell dysfunction there is, recognizing it and treating it appropriately. Mm, That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, And and when when you talk about that, there's a lot of contributions, right? The changes Mm -hmm. in the gut microbiota can contribute to that. Infections, whether past or present, uh, there's a whole list of things that then you look at, including food additives, for example, or food sensitivities. Uh, I didn't want to just leave you hanging. No, that makes makes a lot of sense. (laughs) And how can we better assess the risk for developing type 2 diabetes in clinical practice, including evaluating prediabetes? That's perfect. Um, I I think it's really all about looking at what has happened to that patient so far in terms of their history, what medications have they been on, uh, what infections past or present, what reactivated infections they might have, what exposures have they had, sort of what life have they lived, what's been their gene environment interaction uh, throughout their life, and maybe even preconceptually, and then trying to identify what triggers have contributed to this, because there may be more than one. And we know genetics play a part, but really it's more about the gene environment interaction for each patient. Okay. And based on the evidence and your clinical expertise, what can we do to slow the reverse, to slow or reverse the progression from prediabetes to full-blown type 2 diabetes? Well, I I think that uh, to begin with, something I haven't said is we then need to identify sort of what stage of pancreatic beta cell uh, dysfunction and what types of markers do we use? Because we have lots of new markers on our sort of new kids on the block in terms of looking for inflammatory markers as well, or markers of inflammation, as well as, you know, how do we diagnose pancreatic beta cell dysfunction? And we have quite a few things in our toolbox, or I should say, um, quite a few different factors that we can look at or or, um, um, different uh, sort of inflammatory markers. Uh, We know we've talked a lot about 
fasting insulin. Uh, however, we know that, or the HOMA IR, for instance, but we know that in order for the HOMA IR to be positive, your fasting insulin has to be changed or has to be elevated. And you can have a postprandial insulin that's elevated and not a fasting. So we need to look at these earlier markers. And once we do that, we can then identify how to treat it. We know the uric acid, for instance, is a marker that if it's elevated, and we've had quite a bit of research on this, we have a book that just came out by Dr. David Polmatter, where they're looking at that and how to changes, small changes, um, not just what the reference ranges show, uh, but earlier changes. For example, we know that six is, there's quite a bit of literature around six being too high for uric acid, but even small changes from 4.5 on, for instance, or even less than that can be indicative of already a insulin resistant state, as well as etoponectin and uh, pro-insulin. There's many other markers that I'll talk about, but depending on the value of those markers and where we're at, it was really going to help us better tailor um, our treatment. For example, with respect to the gut microbiome, we have to look at, well, what's going on with the patient's diet? That's sort of our foundation. How much soluble fiber are they ingesting? Because that's the fiber that the uh, gut microbiota is in convert into or create the short chain fatty acids, one of which butyrate is a big fuel for the colonocytes. And it's also really important for it to create that mucin layer, which if you don't have sufficient butyrate and the microbiota need to be fed, they'll actually eat away at that mucin layer. So it's all about sort of looking at these different markers and then figuring out what stage they have dysfunction, they are pancreatic beta cell dysfunction, that is, and then doing everything we can to treat that. And we know that if food and the antioxidants in our food are huge, and I always encourage my patients to eat seven to, to um, I'm sorry, 10 to 12, not seven, but that's what <laughs> most people eat five to seven if they're on a really good diet. Uh, or a good nutritional plan, because sometimes mm -hmm. diet has sort of a negative connotation. Uh, but look at 10 to 12 servings of vegetables and fruit, lots of herbs and spices, because we know that um, they all work at reversing insulin resistance and, and decreasing oxidative stress. And we have some great research, for example, from Dr. Minnick and Dr. Bland, really looking at that group four receptor and uh, how do we increase insulin sensitivity as well as working with the gut microbiota and then really looking at sort of how do you increase insulin sensitivity? How do you decrease right, insulin resistance? And then look at the gut microbiota and, and lastly, how do you improve insulin sensitivity? Those are my rule of threes. That's my general approach because I feel like um, when you can sort of simplify things for patients and educate them well. To me, that's a successful as well as a compliant patient. So I have a lot of little tricks that I use to um, help patients remember. And so that's my rule of threes, right? Decrease insulin resistance, address gut microbiota and improve insulin sensitivity, starting with food as our foundation. And then we add everything that's sort of been science-based. And um, a lot of that is looking at deficiencies, whether they're nutrient deficiencies, for instance. So we're looking at vitamins and minerals, as well as markers of oxidative stress. And then we know that there's different things we can use to lower oxidative stress. Diet is foundation. Then we look at what's going on in terms of oxidative stress and antioxidants that need to be used. And then we add whatever uh, the deficiencies are, including sometimes prescription medications when needed. But in many cases, we can do it with diet and lifestyle alone. Okay. And despite your wonderful advice to your patients and your rule of three, uh, if a person does develop type, type two diabetes, can it be reversed? And if so, how? Absolutely, it can be. I always tell my patients there is a cure for type two diabetes. Now, if we're looking at ICD-10 diagnoses, and our more traditional colleagues, what they'll say is, well, you can say it's uh, controlled, right? So if someone has a hemoglobin A1C of 5.2 or 5.0, by the way, hemoglobin A1C is another great marker that we know small changes in the hemoglobin A1C are very indicative of what's going on and sort of what uh, continuum or when the continuum patients are. Uh, but mm -hmm. as far as ICD-10 diagnoses are concerned, if I have a patient and I have uh, had that had a hemoglobin A1C of 10.2, and I'm able to work with that patient very aggressively and bring that hemoglobin A1C down to 5.2, and I have those patients. It, even though, as far as I'm concerned, it's reversed, as long as they stay, stay controlled. Um, That's amazing. With ICD-10 diagnosis, all I can say is it's controlled. 
I can't say it's reversed or I can't say sort of it's cured because there's no mm -hmm. such thing in terms of, of ICD-10 diagnoses. But what we can say is, well, I can sort of show that all of the potential repercussions that that patient would be suffering are not no longer there. So for all practical purposes, it's reversed. It's all a matter of semantics and sort of what definitions mm -hmm. um, we've used. But yes, absolutely, it can. But it's really looking at all those factors. You have to look at um, sort of what type of progression there is and then look at the inflammatory markers and really work on nutrition, lifestyle, and figuring out what, what deficiencies or insufficiencies there are. Mm -hmm. And what are some common questions you get from patients about their diabetes and how do you usually address those with them? Well, usually a very common one is, am I going to have to eat this way the rest of my life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and usually the answer is yes, but it all depends, right? Because I have been so amazed just how much resiliency the human body has. I mean, I've had patients with diagnoses of being non-compliant with uh, hemoglobin A1C is really high for years. And their question to me is, can I really reverse this? And initially I would say, I don't know, because I don't know just mm -hmm. how much pancreatic beta cell dysfunction there is, or sort of how much can the pancreas forgive, you know, in quotes, so to mm -hmm. speak. And I've been amazed how, you know, you really start looking at those foundational values and changing their lifestyle and changing what the way they interact with their environment and, and with their food and really increasing, you know, all those phytonutrients. And all of a sudden, you know, the hemoglobin A1C decreases and they go from a 10.2 to a five or 5.4. And I usually like it being less than 5.4 because we know that 5.4 is sort of where risk begins. So I always like to get less than that. And so it's been really amazing. And what I have to say, my biggest challenge or what I see patients facing is that some of my more conventional colleagues don't really necessarily understand the importance of really getting the hemoglobin A1C down, right? They don't really understand what does an elevated hemoglobin A1C mean? And particularly, what does that mean to a type two diabetic? Because if you can sort of lower hemoglobin A1C to where below where risk begins. And we know risk begins at 5.4. Um, then you've sort of reversed, right? All of the potential consequences or secondary effects that someone would have. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a, a, a patient, uh, one comes to mind that I'll, actually it's a case I'll discuss, who uh, initially had a hemoglobin A1C over 10. She worked with a, a nutritionist. And by the time the nutritionist um, sent her to me, uh, her hemoglobin A1C actually had already decreased from 8.9, even though the nutritionist felt the patient was very non-compliant. Wow. And uh, from 8.9, I was able to get her down to below 5.4. Now, her main sort of concern on that is that throughout the process, she had to really change her lifestyle. And she did, and she had a lot of family support. But then when she went to see one of her subspecialists, the cardiologist in this case, mm -hmm. his reaction was, oh, I think Dr. Trinidad is being way too aggressive with you. You know, you could cheat the once in a while because a hemoglobin A1C of seven it is, is considered controlled. And so my thought was, no, absolutely not. We need to look at what risk begins. And, you know, seven, hemoglobin of seven, a one, seven, hemoglobin A1C of seven, I get so excited about this, as you can see, <laughs> <laughs> is not really control. I mean, it's, it's sort of the random value that we've attributed to say, well, we have less consequences at that number, but that is not control. And that's not reversal. To me, that's less than 5.4. So what patient who's been working really hard doesn't want to hear that, hey, maybe I don't have to work so hard. So a lot of times, it's not losing track of that patient, it's following up and also having really good communication with our colleagues, some of which may not be sort of practicing this type of medicine. So my big challenge has been to really call my colleagues and say, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of, you know, lifestyle modification and nutrition with my patients. And so this is, I want you to understand what I'm doing so that we're on, on board and we're working to really get this hemoglobin A1C as low as possible and maintain all these uh, mm -hmm. sort of lifestyle changes that my patient has already instituted because they really do need to be lifelong. The nice thing is about this is once you have sort of once you're controlled or uh, I should say reversed, 
once you get your hemoglobin A1C down and patients have really learned how to manage their stress and their nutrition and lifestyle, it's much easier to stay there, right? Mm -hmm. Once you're, you're at that level, you can actually, you know, cheat. Like I, I always tell my patients, you can cheat, but you have to mm -hmm. cheat smartly. You have to know how to do it. And you have to know the consequences so that you avoid them because we're all human beings, mm -hmm. right? Who doesn't cheat once in a while? I mean, of we course. all have families, <laughs> we, you know, we have events, we have birthdays, we have weddings, you know, there's things yes. that we do that make life worth living that we're not going to give up, but it's all about how can we fudge it, so to speak. It's like, how can we cheat a little smarter so mm -hmm. that we avoid the consequences? Because after all, you know, we have to make life worth living too for patients. Absolutely. I mean, what's the point otherwise, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so that's some good news for type two diabetics. I mean, at least there's a little optimism there that you shared. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to share with our audience today? Well, I just think that um, it's really hard sometimes to get our patients to change their minds, to sort of um, empower them to believe that they can do this. And I think that is probably the biggest challenge that we face. You know, we have patients that, um, have sort of been told or conditioned to believe that there's basically not much you can do, right? Mm -hmm. And that once they're type 2 diabetic, they're going to be a type 2 diabetic the rest of their lives. And now we know that that's not true, but we need to really work on patient education and empowering patients to make those changes because mm -hmm. it's not easy. And, um, but I feel like I've had, um, I've been really privileged because I've been able to work with the poorest of the poor. And my background is on the nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. and also with patients who money is not an object and being able to sort of work with both and have that experience, knowing what it takes to have someone who is sort of disadvantaged and disenfranchised and doesn't have a lot of resources, but yet we can take this to that level and really help patients implement it uh, because it's easy when someone has all the resources, they may not be willing. And then you have to really work on that motivational piece. Mm -hmm. um, but I think more, more patients than not, they are willing. They just don't have the tools and they haven't been empowered to do that. Mm -hmm. But we could do that. I mean, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox. And I think to me, that's sort of what makes um, medicine interesting and what keeps me in it and keeps me wanting to learn more and more each day and work with patients. Well, that's wonderful. And you've helped so many people. And thank you for your insightful responses today. It's been oh, a pleasure you. talking pleasure. with you. <laughs> well, it's been my pleasure too. So thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. If you have any questions or if you have any feedback on topics you would like us to discuss in the future, we would love to hear from you. You can always email us at info at cardiometabolichealth.org or find us on social media on Facebook at Cardiometabolic Health or Twitter and Instagram at CMHC underscore CME. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us five stars and a review too. And until next time, have a wonderful day, everyone. <laughs>